Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Time to interrupt your really good fellowship time. But our time for chapel has showed up on the calendar, so we will proceed at this point. <laughs> Stick to the time commitment we set. Welcome everyone to our chapel at Carolina College of Biblical Studies. We look forward to our morning time of worship today that will include a couple of songs and singing and then a message as Dr. Corver brings the final in the series on the life of Joseph. And so we look forward as we again recognize Joseph's maturity to consider the evil that he was that was done against him and yet how God brought good out of that. So it's going to be a challenging and I think comforting message as well. Look forward to it. Uh, let's acknowledge the Lord's presence, ask his enablement for us this morning and go to him in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we pause at this time to acknowledge your presence in our midst. We thank you for the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit that not only is changing us from the inside out, but also enabling us to carry out the work that you have set before us. We pray that during this time of worship, we would honor you with our hearts, our minds, our words, and allow the Holy Spirit to continue to meet the need of the moment and to cause us to see a, a greater understanding of who you are and draw closer. Thank you for our school family. Now enable us to bring praise to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 so I can see the words. <laughs> and I can see you too, so that's good. Who's clicking? Uh, Stephanie, I think, is clicking. Yeah. Stephanie is the key to the clicker.
Well, thank you to uh, David and Richard for leading us in worship. Great theology in both of those songs. Uh, before I get into my message, I guess this is part of my time right now, right? Because I'm up here. <laughs> you haven't been here all semester, but uh, I said way back when we started this semester, one of the things I love about my role here is I get afforded some opportunities. One is to speak like this every month. I chose Joseph because he's such a great guy. Clearly, the Bible says we're all sinners, and Joseph was no exception to that rule. But uh, you see, when you read his story told in length in the book of Genesis, that the Bible doesn't record any, record any major issues that he, that he had. So uh, anyway, <clears throat> so today we come to the conclusion. Uh, it's 13 chapters on Joseph's life, and I've, got, I've had four or five messages to cover 13 chapters. So I'm not sure what to call today's message, When Life Goes South. <laughs> Actually, I started, and here, we'll, we'll stick with this one. Here's a two, two-word description of the whole sermon, but God. Okay? So when life goes south, when your spouse says they're leaving. Some of you have had that dropped on you before. Your spouse just says, I'm out of here. Uh, you have a child or children who are prodigals, and even though you raised them better than that, they're nowhere near where you want them to be. Uh, your place of ministry seems like a spiritual wasteland. I mean, <laughs> nothing good seems to be happening. There's dissension, there's clicks, and you're thinking, why would I stay around here? Because this is a mess. Maybe at your work, your evaluation was not good, and your manager was purposefully vindictive. I mean, they he or she put some stuff in there. It wasn't, it's not even true, but okay, it's now part of your permanent employment record. And or maybe you have a friend or a confidant and they slandered you with some evil intentions. I mean, life goes south. I hear an amen on that one? So when your life seems, that's a critical word, seems ruined, hopeless from a human perspective, what's your response? Jesus. Just like, <laughs> And this is another critical question. When it's in your power to pay back those who ruined your life, then what do you do? Okay? So you're in Bible college, you're a student, staff, faculty, something. You got a Bible on you, I hope. If not, at least you have a device, yes? yes. I got three yeses out of all these people. <laughs> Would you open your Bible or device to Genesis 45? <clears throat> As we consider <laughs> God's working in life situations, or put it another way, when life goes south, but God. Okay? Genesis 45. Here's a little bit of context. Remember, context is king. So Joseph has tested his ten brothers, because remember, he got sold when he was 17. Now he's 39. He's wondering, are they the same ten older brothers that they were when they did this to me? And they have passed the test. They're not the same guys. Okay, so they've passed the test, and so, all right, so they get some food, and they go back home to Canaan, but he kept one of them there. Still a little bit of an ongoing test. It says, you, you, Simeon, stay in here. You go back, and if you really have that little brother, that 12th one, you, you bring him back. You remember that struggle, right? Mm -hmm. Jacob says, no, 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 finally, we got no food. We got, it, we got to do this. So they come back. This is their second trip to Egypt for the nine older ones. Simeon has been stuck in Egypt in prison, and this is Benjamin's first trip. And Judah has revealed how changed he was, because when we saw him, he was committing adultery with his daughter-in-law, and real arrogantly, pharisaically said, we ought to put her to death, because she's, you know, oh, you're the dad. <laughs> Everything changed with that. Well, now he, in the last time we were together on this topic, he basically says, I'll, I'll take Benjamin's place. If anything happens to Benjamin, dad, I'll take his place. So that's, that's kind of where we pick up the story. All right? So we get to chapter 45, verses 1 to 4. I'm going to just call this the revelation. Remember, Joseph's this powerful guy, and he's been speaking through an interpreter. And because he's 39 and he's looking Egyptian with his clothing and hair and all this stuff, they think, ah, oh, okay. Here we go. Verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried, have everyone go out from me. So there was no, one, no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. So you get the picture. He's, he's overcome with emotion. He says to all of his servants, y'all need to leave. 
they all leave. The palace or that suite or whatever, they're gone. Verse 2, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the house of Pharaoh heard it. And you can just imagine how he's wailing. People aren't even in the room hear this stuff. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. I guess so. <laughs> By the way, the, the Hebrew word for dismayed there means amazed, frightened, or terrified. I mean, they like, wow, jaws hit the floor. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer, I'm guessing, to check out his eyes and some of those facial features that even when you're 17 or now 39, those don't change and they would recognize. And so they got closer like, wow, <laughs> it really is Joseph. Oh, and then he tells them something that nobody in the room, nobody in the whole world knew what he's about to say. He said, I am your brother Joseph. Well, okay. But here's what nobody would have known. And I'm pretty sure they never talked about amongst the ten of them. Whom you sold into Egypt. Ooh. <laughs> wow. Uh, I mean, he, he's been using an interpreter up until now. And here's the first two words out of his mouth. He says, I need Yosef. I am Joseph. Can you imagine speaking to somebody who you think doesn't know your language? Yeah. All these months, and trips back and forth, and they say, oh, <laughs> this guy speaks our language. I'm reminded of the story. Remember Saul before he became Paul? On the road to Damascus, he absolutely hated Jesus. And he hated everybody who followed Jesus. And on the road to Damascus, he sees this light, and he's like, what in the world? Who are you? And Jesus from heaven says, I am Jesus. I am Jesus. Very similar to here, just two words. I'm Joseph. I'm Jesus, whom, you, whom you're persecuting. <laughs> Imagine the horror, the shock, the fear of those ten brothers. Wow, we are busted now. <laughs> I, I'm, I have to tell you, I've, I have a lifelong love of reading, but I am not very well read on some of the classics. So in the last few years, I've been trying to work at reading some of the great classics. It's become one of my favorites. Uh, the Count of Monte Cristo. Anybody here read that? Yeah. If you haven't, great reading over Christmas break. Yep. Written by a guy named Alexander Dumas. Looks like Dumas, but pronounced Dumas. And he wrote it in the 1800s, early 1800s, during the French Revolution. And there's a key character through the whole book. His name was Edmund Dantes. And Edmund's a young guy. On his wedding day, he's falsely accused by a friend who's trying to win the heart of his fiance of sedition against, the, the, against Napoleon. So he's literally carted off to a barren island in the sea, prison fortress, and there he rots for years. And I won't be a spoiler here, but he... Uh, he gets a cellmate that kind of, kind of gets some rocks, boulders, whatever, between the two cells. They talk back and forth, and he, he finally escapes, and his, the other guy tells him about a fortune on an island, and he goes and gets that fortune and declares himself to be the Count of Monte Cristo. That's the island where he gets the fortune from. And the rest of the book is about him paying back the people who had done him good when he was young, but then the majority of it is him <laughs> paying back those who'd done him bad. Now see, here's human nature. We love it when the bad guy gets it, right? Don't tell me you're not this way. You're like, yes! And we want him to get it yesterday, right? That's not how this story ends. The 10 bad guys don't get it. So Joseph says, I'm, I'm Joseph, okay. Wow. So, question for you, rhetorical here. What about your revelation? What, who do you need to tell a, something in, you, in your life that's going on? And, and what is it that needs to be said? Let me give you a few possible ideas. Maybe you have a, if you're a leader, a volunteer at church who's really quiet, they love being behind the scenes, and you need to pull them aside and say, you know what, I, I so appreciate your service for Jesus here, because they rarely hear that kind of stuff. Maybe that's the... Revelation. Maybe it's uh, one of your children, and you need to say, you need to hear, you need to hear, you say this to your child, your dad, or in your case, mom, whatever, dad is so proud of you. Listen, I'm the father of three kids. 
My kids are not perfect. They take after their dad. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I can't say that I'm proud of them and the things that they do. They need to hear that. Maybe you have a family member or neighbor that you have not declared this to. Maybe you've not declared it to anybody. Maybe the revelation you need to give is, I've decided to follow Jesus. Kind of come out of the closet in the sense of your faith. I I'm a follower of Jesus. They don't know that yet. Maybe they just know something's different about you. Maybe it's to a friend or somebody, and you say this, God's called me to vocational ministry. It scares me to death, but he's called me to serve him vocationally, and you need to let that out of the bag. What is it you need to reveal to somebody else? Joseph said to his ten brothers, I'm Joseph. <laughs> and uh, they were staggered. Before we get to the next part of the story, sometimes a revelation can be staggered. Let me give you this illustration, kind of a segue to the second main point. Years ago, I was a pastor, and uh, y'all know where Moore County is? Yes? What, what's the kind of the thing in Moore County? Give you a hint, you don't know? Golf, and so, oh, three or four times a year, I would golf with some of the guys in the church, Friday afternoon, right? <clears throat> so we had this golf date set up, and I had two guys in my church, me makes number three, and in golf, usually you play with a foursome. Well, the fourth guy was not a guy that I knew, but one of the guys in my church did some work with him, so he comes along. <laughs> well, it was one of those days where we were going to golf right after lunch on Friday, and everybody's coming from work, so we scrambled and Literally, our tee time, I'll say it's 1 o'clock, and at 1.57, the last guy pulls up, and I mean, we're on the tee box, and off we go. No introduction, no nothing. So this guy who's golfing, I'll call him Frank. Frank knew Russ, but he didn't know Dwight and me. He just golfed with one guy he knows and two guys. He has no clue who they are. Okay? We just golfing away. And about every second or third hole, Frank, who was a pretty good golfer, would, you know, shank one into the woods or hit one in the water, and it would be followed by a, Blankety blank, you know, drop the F bomb and the GDs and the stuff like that. And it's just, you know, whatever. Okay. So, if anything about golf, you know, par four is a long hole, yes? You can't hit the green in one shot unless you're unbelievable. And we weren't, okay? <laughs> so, we hit our tee shots out into the fairway and we're waiting for the green to clear. We've got about three minutes. So, we're just standing there by our carts. It's a nice fall day. And Russ, who's my friend, who invited this Frank guy, he got a great sense of humor. Now, we're on the 14th hole. We've been playing for like three and a half hours. He says to Frank, he says, hey, Frank, did I tell you that Bill's my pastor? <laughs> now, this guy's been effing and GDing the whole time. <laughs> and he, he went ashen, and he said, is that true? I said, yeah, it is true. And he's like, oh, I, I'm so sorry if I didn't know that. I was talking that way, da, 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 da. And I said, trying to get him off the hook a little bit, I said, Frank, listen, I've heard language like that before. But then to be hopefully pastoral, I said, you know what? But ultimately, you don't have to give an account to me for your language. You're going to have to talk to somebody else about your language. Okay? I kid you not, the next four holes, he couldn't hit a golf ball. <laughs> I, and when we finished 18, it was no pleasantries. I mean, like straight to the car. <laughs> You see, this, this revelation shook him up like, mm, what do I do with that? <laughs> now back to the story. These ten brothers, Joseph's got no, I mean, Benjamin's got no issue because he, he didn't do any of this stuff. But the ten older brothers are in a quandary. What do we do with that revelation? I mean, not only is Joseph who he is. He's got the power to do whatever he wants to, to us. Mm -hmm. like, hmm, this is not good. Well, look at his response. Verse 5. <clears throat> I'll call this the declaration part one. So there's the revelation. Here, here's who I am. He makes a great declaration. His theology comes through. Verse 5 through 9. <clears throat> now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine that has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve you, for you a remnant on, in the earth and to keep you alive by great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all of his household and ruler in all the land of Egypt. Hurry, go up to my father and say to him, 
Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. So he says three times, if I'm counting correctly, God sent me. Verse 4, God sent me before, before you. Verse uh, 7, God sent me. Verse 8, you didn't send me, but God did. You, you get the idea? <coughs> he, he's saying, listen, you, you did what you did, but God's going to do what he's going to do. Remember but God? <laughs> he's going to do what he's going to do. God sent me. Okay. And two times he says, God made me. God made me Pharaoh, uh, like a father to Pharaoh. He's made me Lord of all of Egypt. So again, another rhetorical question. Do you, do you, see, your, uh, do you see God as in control in your life, the one directing it? So who led you to your current ministry? I assume you have a ministry at your church. Who, uh, who led you to CCBS? Who made you boss, teacher, parent, whatever role it is that you're filling? Well, you got two options here. Either God did those things, or persons or circumstances did those things. And when things go south, if a person is the one who got you where you are, then you blame the person. And if it's circumstances, you just change the circumstances. Now, but if God's the one who's behind all this, that changes everything. Look at verse 15. Let's go down a little bit. By the way, we're going to come back to this declaration in another chapter in a little bit. Verse 15. After he talks about, hey, I'm going to take care of you and so forth. Verse 15, he kissed all his brothers. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'd be tempted to do something different to my brothers. But anyway. <laughs> and wept on them. Afterwards, his brothers talked to him. They've been silent the whole time. I imagine, look up here, man. I imagine they were kind of like this. I mean, because what do you do? They talked to him. The last time you hear, way back in the story, you may not remember this, in chapter 37, verse 4, when... When they sold him, it says after jo Joseph had brought an evil report that they could not talk to him because they hated him so much. So they have not, to their knowledge, talked to their brother Joseph in 22 years. Now they have when they first time they met, but they didn't realize it was Joseph. So this is the first time, to their knowledge, they've talked to him since he was 17. So they talk again. Ooh. <laughs> Joseph weeps. Look in verse 17. And Joseph, excuse me, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this uh, and load your beast. I'm sorry, I missed the, where do you, uh, hate it when that happens somewhere in verse, oh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong chapter. He's going to weep in just a minute. So finally they speak, verse 20, I'll, I'll, let me skip to verse 20. Do not concern yourselves with your goods for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Now remember, he could have said, oh, well, you're moving here, but listen, I'm going to put you in solitary. I'm going to give you a bare minimum. What does he say? Listen, I've got access to crazy resources. And so don't even bother packing. Just bring your families down here, and I'll provide the best Egypt has. Hmm. So we're going to skip, skip over several chapters, but in the chapter we're skipping over, Jacob and his ten older sons and their families moved to Egypt. The Bible tells us there's <laughs> 70 in this group by now, counting all the Joseph and his family and the brothers and their family. So 70. Jacob finally gets there. He lives for 17 years in Egypt. And uh, he dies. Let's get to chapter 50, verse 15. They just buried Dad. They got permission from Pharaoh to go bury him back in the land of Canaan. Now they're back. Verse 15. Everybody in 50-15? Then Joseph, when Joseph saw, excuse me, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, so this is the ten kind of talking amongst themselves, what if Joseph should bear a grudge against us and pay us back full for all the wrong we did to him? See that what if? Here's what that means. They did not really believe Joseph had forgiven them. Yeah. If you believe something, you consider it to be true, and that, that's it. Yeah. For example, uh, I know for a fact that I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus. You know why? Because I got a promise in the gospel and I believed him for it. Now, if I struggle with that, I'll think, well, what if I mess up? Then I don't really believe his promise. He gave me a promise called everlasting life. By the way, it is not dependent on my performance. We're good with this. 
it depends on your performance, you are never going to be secure in your salvation. They did not believe Joseph really forgave them. Here's what I think they thought. He's just being nice till the old man is out of the way. And as soon as he gets a chance, <laughs> we're in trouble. And now the chance has come. Verse uh, 16, we're skipping over a little bit. They basically say, hey, Dad, Dad told us <laughs> that when he was gone, you know, take it easy on us. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but here's what I think. This is a Corver thing, right? I think they're lying. Mm -hmm. The Bible records nowhere where Jacob said to the ten brothers, do this. I think they're just making this up. So, hey, Dad wants you to you know, be nice to us even though he's now gone. Notice Joseph's response. Uh, by the way, here's what they're saying that J Jacob said, verse 17. Thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did wrong. They're saying, that's what Dad said. And they just repeat that to Joseph. Now Joseph's response. Now please forgive the transgression of your brothers, excuse me, the transgressions of the servants of God and of, of your father. And Joseph wept. when they, He's just like, really? <laughs> you see him weeping several times in this passage. Yeah. Verse 18, then the brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. They still don't believe. It's like, oh. <laughs> I mean, it's like begging for their life. Oh, please, please, would you forgive us? And here everything changes. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? I'm not sovereign over all this stuff. God is. Verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me. By the way, I love Joseph's honesty. He just said, Well, I'm so glad you sold me and kind of messed up my life. No, <laughs> it's not true. You meant it for evil. And if you're the kind that writes in your Bible, just underline or highlight the next two words. But God. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Here's my quick kind of description of the sovereignty of God. You ready for it? Thank you, Rodney. <laughs> God's in control of all things in all places at all times. Okay. Within the realm of that control, God allows people to choose. And God uses all the choices people make, that's good, sinful, or neutral, to bring about His intended outcome, which is His glory. Okay? And lastly, this is an important part of my understanding, God's sovereign will can best be seen in the rearview mirror. Because when you're in the middle of it, here's what you think. God, what are you doing right now? And you know what he often does? He just remains silent. Like, what, are you, what are you doing? I'm quite sure because we're studying Joseph's life, he would have said to Joseph when he was 17, so what's God doing in your life right now? He would have thought, I don't know, but it seems like nothing. And he gets falsely accused of rape. What's God doing? I don't know, but it seems like nothing. Gets in prison. Gets forgotten. I don't know. But now he can see, oh, <laughs> that's how God was working all that stuff to get to this point. <laughs> so I had a little bit to think about this. So I think about Moses. Remember Moses when he was found as a baby? And the Bible tells us he was educated at all the best schools in Egypt. He's 40 years old. I mean, he's got the Ph.D. from, and you fill in your school, right? The best school. And then he goes from 40 to 80 watching some stinking sheep in a desert. You're thinking... If you're Moses, thinking, wow, that was a lot of wasted education. But then later in his life, God says, you know what? Why don't you write the first five books of the Bible? You know, it'd be kind of important to be a good student and writer if you want to write the Pentateuch, right? Can y'all do this? You think about David. The first 15, 16 years of his life, he's watching 100 or so of his dad's little woolly sheep. What a preparation for a king. But then it says in the Psalms, and he... He took David from shepherding sheep to shepherding his flock of Israel. He learned some lessons early that he could use later. What about Peter? You know the famous story about Peter three times. I don't know the guy. I don't know the guy. I don't know the guy. How could God use that? He writes this book called First Peter. And in First Peter 5, he says, Beware, you have an adversary, the roaring lion. How does he know about that? He remembers when the roaring lion got the best of him. Oh, and we're coming up to that time of year. <laughs> we read the Christmas story all the time. 
There's a Caesar in Rome who thinks, you know what, I need more money. So let's do a census. He thinks he's in charge, okay? So he orders a census so he can raise taxes. And Mary and Joseph end up in Bethlehem. And Caesar's in Rome thinking, I'm calling the shots around here. And God's like, no, you're not. I'm calling the shots. I'm the one who gets them there. He used to census, but that's how he gets them there. I have a good friend on our president's cabinet. His name is Chris Godwin. Some of you know Chris. Here's Chris's story. He's retired now. He's a retired attorney, late 60s. When he was in his early 30s, he was an alcoholic, and he was addicted to cocaine. He's, down, he's not a big guy, about 5'8", whatever, but he was down to 105 pounds. He was so emaciated from cocaine and alcohol. His cocaine dealer, the guy he bought from to do his habit, got busted by the police. And so to kind of help cop a deal, he says, well, let me tell you who some of my customers are. Chris Godwin's one of my customers. The police came and arrested Chris. You know, when you're an attorney, you're not supposed to do stuff like that. Right. He lost his law license. He's 105 pounds, he has no law license, and he's in jail. Wow. He's like, wow. What good could ever come from that? Well, he would tell you if he were here. In the next several months, he heard the gospel, came to faith because of all that. And this past Saturday, celebrated 35 years of sobriety. 35 years. Amen. Yeah. I mean, it's like, how, how do you? Because a cocaine dealer turned him in. And God turned everything around. That's the kind of God we have. Je Past Dr. Phillips, I started to say Rodney and Pastor. I got a lot of names for Rodney. <laughs> Last week he did a great job covering Joseph's life, Joseph, Jacob's life. And there's a verse about Jacob's life, and he had far too much material just like I do, but there's a verse in Jacob's life when the ten boys, excuse me, the nine came back after the first trip. Basically said, hey, here's what happened to that guy in Egypt. Da -da 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 -da. And we can't go the next time until we take the young brother. And uh, in Genesis 42, 36, here's what Jacob says. All things are against me. Mm -hmm. Now think about that. He lost, he thinks he's lost a son. He's got one who's temporarily in prison. And his conclusion is, all things are against me. Mm -hmm. Okay? No, they weren't, but that's what he thinks. Mm -hmm. Remember Naomi in the book of Ruth? Mm -hmm. Ruth's mother-in-law? She lost a husband, she lost two sons, and she decided, I'm going back home, leaving Moab, going back home. And she gets home, I'm quoting from Ruth 1.20, it says this, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. See, that's her assessment. God is a mean God, he's dealt with me very bitterly. So how do you get this, uh, Joseph's mentality versus the Jacob and the Naomi mentality. I mean, is that just like, just happen? I don't think so. I think it's our theology. Y'all know the kind of a modern song, worship song? I think it's Chris Tomlin, but that's the one I think of when I think of it. You're a good, good guy. Mm -hmm. That's who you are. That's who you are. Mm -hmm. And I am loved. loved by you. That's who I am. Yep. Jacob, at least for a while, and Naomi, at least for a while, either didn't know that truth or didn't live that truth. If you'd ask them, they'd have said, well, he's an okay guy, but sometimes things are out of his control. No, they're not. He's always been a good guy, and for those who followed Jesus, he's always loved them. That's, that's true. Now, the point is, the question is, do we really believe this stuff? And I would suggest to you, Honestly, Bill Corver doesn't always believe this stuff. I do here, but I don't always live that because when things go south, <sighs> you know, anybody with me? Yes. 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 John Newton, name you probably know, wrote some hymns, one of them, Amazing Grace. You might have heard that song before. <laughs> Here's another one, not quite as famous, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. Okay. He wrote one I'm pretty sure you've never heard of. It's called, None of on earth I desire but thee. Anybody know the words? I didn't think you did. I never heard of them before. 
He wrote it in 1779, so 200 and almost 50 years ago. Here are the words to the first stanza. How tedious and tasteless the hours when Jesus I no longer see. Sweet prospects, sweet birds, and sweet flowers have all lost their sweetness to me. The midsummer sun shines but dim, and the fields strive in vain to look gay. But when I am happy in him, December's as pleasant as May. See, Joseph, he's in the kind of December of life, or he has been for a lot of years. No, God, God did this. God's doing this. One of my favorite contemporaries, he's getting older now, uh, Chuck Swindoll, says that great sermons should be able to be rehearsed or stated in one sentence. Like, wow. Well, here it is. Stillness with Swindoll. Greatness is revealed mainly in our attitudes. Joseph has this attitude because it's his theology. Yeah, you, you did this stuff was evil, but God. But God's a good guy. So you fill in some blanks. My parents were terrible, but God. My ministry is tough, but God. The doctor says, but God. My skills and giftings are minimal, but God. What's your blank? My, but God. Great theology from a guy who's not necessarily a theologian, Dr. Jim Dobson. Do you trust his heart, that's in God, do you trust his heart even when you can't see his hand? That's a great line. Because a lot of times in life, you don't see God saying that. I don't either. I'm pretty sure in the 22 years from when the story started to where we are today, Genesis 45, now much later, Genesis 50, Joseph didn't see what God was doing. But here's what I'm convinced he did. He trusted, you know what? God's going to do what God's going to do. And it's going to turn out okay. Because it's going to be for his glory. He's a good, good God. And I'm loved by him. When that's your theology, it changes your perspective. Let me lead some prayer. Father, you are a good, good God. That never changes. Sometimes our circumstances uh, change. And uh, we have no idea what you're up to. I pray that you'd help us to trust your heart even when we can't see your hand and it doesn't look like we're going to see it anytime soon. Lord, whatever it is in our life, just help us remember these two words. But God, pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Okay, what a great message to take us on home through this semester with. Um, a final exam, but God. <laughs> final papers, but God. So that's our message. That's our message. And uh, your, your professors, uh, us on staff, are praying for you to finish strong this term. And... Um, so we're praying for you, and uh, today is our last chapel of the semester. We'll meet again in January, so we'll have more information on that forthcoming. Uh, we've been inviting you to complete the adult um, priority survey, and uh, that time period is now over, and we offered a $100 gift card drawing for each one who completed that, so we've conducted the drawing. And we're happy to announce this morning that the winner is Miss Terry Wright. <laughs> so we thank everyone who completed that. We really, really did. Um, regardless of your motive, <laughs> thank you for taking the time. Wish each of you a blessed, uh, safe, healthy, happy, uh, Merry Christmas. Let's pray together. Father, again, we pause to give you thanks for this opportunity that we've had to share in the word and to worship your most holy name. And we pray we would take this message to heart, that it would cause us to have a greater sense of assurance and awareness and trust in you. We are grateful for all that you do in the midst of the most challenging circumstances. 
Help us to receive it as from your hand and to recognize by faith that you will bring good out of it. That'll be for your glory. We're grateful to be involved in this process as we humble ourselves before you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless. I don't know that I can ever say that with regard to this. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> yeah.